Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Good. And welcome to those of you who are on the live stream. I've got a few announcements from the Paulson Cyber Incubator and Entrepreneurial Center and some other entities at DSU that have activities going on that I'm going to tell you about. And then I will do an introduction of Russell Kareem and his wife Liz have joined us here. So to begin with, at the end of each of the tables and then the tables out there in the lobby, you will see some of some handouts regarding some of the activities that we have going on. If something interests you, feel free to take it, or you can certainly send me an email, dsu paulson p a u l s o n center c e n t e r one word at dsu.edu, and we will happily get you any of the information that you might like. One of the first handouts that you have lists all of the workshops and the entrepreneurial educational programs that we have going on for the rest of the fall and then into the early spring. So if you're interested in starting a business, you can certainly join the Fast Launch program and take the boot camp, the customer discovery workshop, and the business model business plan workshop which will make you eligible to apply for funding to help you start your business. And then there is the Launch Lab program that is also mentioned in there. If you are interested in or need something a little deeper regarding help or information for starting your business, Launch Lab will work with you more intensively over about six weeks to help you get your business model locked down. So both of those programs are free. Whoops, I bumped Russell's computer. Sorry about that, Russell. Both of those programs are free to you. Launch Lab and Fast Launch will help you prepare for the next handout that is there, the Governor's Giant Vision Competition. And so if you want to apply for the Governor's Giant Vision Competition, you can take those particular programs, one or the other, and then you can work with our office to get prepared for the Governor's Giant Vision Competition. Not that I ever brag, and those of you who know me know that I am not a big person to toot my own horn. But let me tell you that the two winners last year of the Governor's Giant Vision Competition, the winner in the Business Division and the winner in the Student Competition Division, both worked with me intensively on their business, and they each won. So the student won $5,000, thank you, and the business won $20,000. Nine of the 13 people who applied, nine of the 13 finalists, I'm sorry, in the business division and nine of the 13 finalists in the student division were part of our fast launch program or our launch lab program. So these two programs will set you up for success if you definitely want to start a business. For those of you that might like to see what a business pitch actually looks like after you've created your business model, this Wednesday, as part of Global Entrepreneurship Week and our celebration, we are doing the final pitches for the fall cohort of Launch Lab. That will take place at 4 p.m. out in the Entrepreneurial Building, which is north of the Field House and it will last about an hour. And again, as the Paulson Center always does, we'll have a bunch of great food because we like to have food with our particular events. So it'll be about an hour, four to five o'clock out there. You'll hear the pitches of the companies that made it through the entire Launch Lab program. For those of you that want a little something else to do tonight after you're finished with this wonderful presentation from Russell, you can go over, cross the parking lot, 
to the library, to the art gallery there, and the Native American Student Association has artist Jerry Fogg over there who will be showing his work. So if you're interested in that, this is Native American Heritage Month. So that is an activity going on on campus tonight at 7 p.m. And then the final handout that you have in the batch of handouts that are right there in front of you is we are doing a needs drive. The Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee here at Dakota State University is doing a needs drive for the writers, the Native American writers, that will be 125 of them that will be coming across the state from Pierre going to Mankato, Minnesota. They will come through Madison on December 14. As part of their ride through here, we give gifts to them. And those gifts are in the form of needs that they have. That's the needs flyer that you see in front of you. So they need things like warm winter coats, gloves, hats, uh, blankets, thermal hand warmers, lip balm, trail mix, protein bars, and a number of other things. So you'll find the various items that are needed on that flyer. I am collecting them up at the Paulson Center, but if that's too difficult for you, we will happily come and pick up the items to make your life easier so that we can help the riders that are going to be riding across this state in the cold of December, and you all know what I am talking about. So it could be a blizzard, and they still go. They have to make it there by December 26, which is the anniversary of when the 36 fellow natives in the 1880s, the largest mass hanging in United States history, when their fellow natives were hanged for breaking a treaty when in fact they went to war for a treaty that was broken on them. There's a whole very interesting history on it. And in fact, Jane has written some lovely articles over the years about 38 plus two. So feel free to go into the DSU archives, type into the search bar 38 plus two, and you can find out the whole wonderful story of how it started. It is a healing and peace mission. It is designed for everyone to, to come together. So it is not a journey of anger. It is a journey of acceptance and love. With that, those are our announcements from the Paulson Cyber Incubator. So let me tell you about today's speaker. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Liz, for driving here from Des Moines. And just so you all know and understand, they're leaving here tonight, right from here after this presentation, to drive back to Des Moines, because Russell's got to get on a plane tomorrow morning to go meet with investors in LA. That's part of being an entrepreneur who's in fundraising mode. So, Russell Kareem, he's a serial entrepreneur. I've known him now for, holy cow, what, a dozen years? Yeah, about a dozen years. He's a serial entrepreneur, a programmer, and as he now has on his current website, DocI, he is a supply chain enthusiast. Russell has a degree in computer science. He's very good at looking at problems and figuring out a way to solve that problem and make it more efficient. He launched DocEye in 2021. It is a sustainability and ethical sourcing platform for the clothing industry. As a student at the University of Northern Iowa, where I met Russell, he started and sold several businesses. Some were social engagement businesses, some were in the food industry and food systems. He's done many different businesses that I know he's going to tell you about in his presentation tonight. DocEye has allowed him to return to his roots and family ties in clothing production and his family in Bangladesh. The company has worked with 50 prominent clothing brands and 500 manufacturers around the world. Russell has received numerous awards in entrepreneurship and leadership. 
and most recently an award from his alma mater, the University of Northern Iowa, thanking him for all of his knowledge and, and his entrepreneurship and his help to the other students there. We want to welcome our students here in this room from FBLA, DMD, CEO, the ARL, all of the rest of you who've come up. And thank you for ITS for streaming this and marketing department here at DSU for your promotion and all of the other entities who helped us make this a wonderful event that we're excited to have. We're going to let Russell speak now. We'll take questions at the end. I will run to you with the microphone because we want to get the questions for the live stream. So raise your hand when you have a question and I'll get the microphone to you. So let's all welcome Russell Kareem. Thank you, Katrin. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. I think I wanted to first just start with thanking a few people for making you know making this possible for us here today. Uh, obviously, thank to Katrin Koda, our uh, director of economic development here, uh, for opportunity for me to come here and sharing my story. Uh, Michael Roach, uh, thank you for having me in your class. I think I was able to share my story to your students. I think that was really fun just to do that. I always enjoy. Uh, sharing my stories and the upbringing and the journey that I had. Uh, obviously, uh, captains, your colleagues, Ashley and Pete, uh, thanks for them. I think uh, I was able to uh, tour uh, the Mad Lab and I think all the amazing, amazing stuff that you guys are working on, which is I was very impressed uh, visiting that and seeing the uh, public-private partnership that the university really focused on how they are really able to implement this program at the university. So again, I think the reason um, Katrin reached out to me um, today um, to share with you guys uh, kind of my journey. Uh, so a little bit of, uh, I think what I'll be talking about today is um, I actually came to US as a national student. Uh, so really uh, my journey was as a international student to being an entrepreneurial student and doing the entrepreneurship degree. Uh, to becoming uh, entrepreneurs and starting multiple companies. So I think uh, I'll be sharing a lot of my stories, a lot of failures that I had and where and how I have got here. Uh, that's kind of what I would, I would like to talk to them. Um, and I will have a lot of visually, you know, try to kind of bring you guys back to my journey, like where and how I have started that. Um, so with that, I think first of all, just wanted to start why I'm here and uh, my current position. So as Katrin just mentioned to them, uh, my current company uh, called Dakai.com, uh, we're building uh, the future of clothing supply chain. Um, so what that mean is uh, we created a marketplace uh, that enable small to mid sized clothing brand uh, and designers to really go from idea to final delivered product uh, ethically, sustainably, and cost-effectively uh, through a single technology platform. Uh, I mentioned about earlier a um, little bit. Uh, so I think, first of all, just as you're building this company in my current uh, position and current company, I think it's kind of important to share why and how I and how I have get here and people who helped me. And again, part of the building doc, I, um, I think wanted to show you guys a short video here uh, how we as a company kind of differentiate and how we help. So for our company, not only we are able to help designers and clothing brand in the US side, helping them with their design ideations, but also we're on the ground. We're the one helping on the ground, verifying those factories, able to see my fabrics, how the fabrics are manufactured, how the clothes are manufactured um, for, 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 for us, and able to bring that perspective. So 
how I got in in this industry, and I think I'll have a future slide that I'll, I'll talk about it, but this is so important for our generations, especially for Gen Z and millennials. They're asking where their products are coming from. They want to know how the clothes are produced. And that's exactly why it's so important to really bring the transparency, bring that visibility in how things are done. Uh, so I think uh, with that, I'll kind of a little bit talk about a little bit of my team who really helped me and continue to help us uh, to get here. So uh, this is kind of my team, my current team, the, our executive team, um, a little bit of myself. As Captain mentioned, I have exited a few companies uh, in technology and able to scale that uh, those companies. And uh, But it wasn't always like that. I think I started with, this is a polished pitch that you get, get to see, but I was like one of you guys. Uh, one of you doing this business and trying to contribute that. So uh, I had few successful business, a lot of failed business. Um, that's kind of my background. Uh, our um, uh, chief operating officer, uh, Rebecca, uh, she comes from a uh, fashion supply chain. She worked in Kabbalah's, Nexus Outdoor, over 30 years in this clothing manufacturing in design and production. Uh, so bringing a lot of experience in this space uh, Koshid, who works in this uh, for the largest supply chain company uh, called Lian Fang for over uh, 18 years, brings in over 26 years of experience, and Dina Kaden has over uh, 20 years of experience. The reason I'm mentioning is building a successful company requires a lot of people, a lot of great people kind of helping you. Obviously, I'm the one who get to share the story, but the reason I get to share this story is because of these people. Uh, these are the people who help me every day set the vision, set the culture for the company that we get to build. Uh, so with that again, I wanted to share that why, how we got here, how I got here. Uh, so I actually grew up in a country, um, small country, I don't know if you see it, I don't get to see it from here, uh, but I grew up uh, uh, in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, which is a very small country in uh, Southeast Asia. And as you guys can see, we have 166 million people in Bangladesh. It's almost, the land mass of Bangladesh is almost the same land as the state of Iowa, where I'm from. So if you think of putting 166 million people in the state of Iowa, that's what Bangladesh is going to look like. Uh, so again, if you think about like when grew up in this kind of different perspective, different culture, we're fighting for resources. 165 million or 66 million people were trying to start the business. They are strapped with resources. So I think when you grew up in a different culture and different perspective, you always come up with perspective. How do you do things differently, right? So that's a little about Bangladesh. Bangladesh is the second largest clothing exporter in the world. So if you go to all the clothing store, you buy it, next time you go in, check the labels, you might see they're gonna be made in Bangladesh clothes that you might be wearing or you already have in your closet. So I actually grew up in the industry. My family was involved in this clothing manufacturing. Uh, but uh, after I sold, you know, I went to UNI when I was 17, I actually moved to the Iowa and got my degree in computer science and entrepreneurship. Uh, and I had few startups. Um, I was always entrepreneurial, wanted to start. But I think more than that, I was more asking questions. I was like, there gotta be better way to do things. I think the question of there gotta be better way to do things, that was really helped me to see businesses, see problems differently that there has to be a better way to do this. Uh, so with that, uh, I wanted to kind of, again, just keep uh, going into this path of this current business that I have, and which is actually I talked about Dr. Roche's class as well in uh, a little bit of sustainability. I think one of the perspective we have taken in our business to really differentiate ourselves is, we, you know, we consume so much clothes. As, as a generation, we use so much clothes. And again, one of the stats I have given at the, at the class that uh, it takes about 700 gallons of fresh water to make a denim jeans. So just think of from that perspective that how much water that we use to make some of our clothes. We don't really think about it. Uh, again, it's the same lifetime. Some of the clothes that we wear, we use about 700 gallons of water to keep washing those clothes. So again, if you're seeing the perspective of sustainability, uh, one of the perspectives we wanna bring into this industry is 
there are better ways to do stuff. And that's, what we, that's the message uh, we bring to these current brands that what can we do different? So this is actually one of our factories. Uh, if you looked into this factory, this is actually a seven story building. It looks like a green space, but it's actually hidden behind. There's actually a factory behind it. And one of the story I was sharing is, this is really interesting way. I really enjoy the story behind it, why they actually built this way. And taking nature uh, or problem in, a, in, in this kind of owners, how the leadership has been thinking, how they change the perspective of the company. So they have this company is called uh, or, or, um, is called Karupuna, this factory. Uh, they are this factory in, in one of the districts in Bangladesh. Uh, they make a lot of handmade. So if you see a uh, lot of like uh, rugs, you, you probably use like a lot of the stuff that comes from this kind of factory. Uh, but the problem this factory had, they had 7,000 workers working, but during the summer season, it was really hot for the employees to work in these factories. And the factory owners had to come up with a solution. How can we make this environment comfortable for our employees? So they build this green space to really keep this building cool. And also, they also have water flows around this factory to really create this sustainability of how can we use nature, how can we use environment uh, as of green spacing and the water to keep this uh, factory cool uh, during the hot season, summer season, or keep it warm during the winter season. So again, as I said, there are better factories out there that is taking initiatives. And I wanted to take an opportunity to showcase that there are initiatives that has been taken to really do better for this environment. Uh, here, you know, so with that, uh, I wanted to kind of take a little bit back uh, in the journey is how did I get here? Uh, and I think we have some students here. Uh, one of the things I really enjoy visiting this campus here, uh, that singular focus of cybersecurity and really looking into this AI and really the technology focus that the university have. And one of the things I was talking to Catherine, how do you, how do we uh, help students to think that business and tech and all those things go together? you have to really communicate all those technology that you have at the end of the day you still have to communicate you have to apply to solve real problem so I, I wanted to share my journey how I get here is first of all I wanted to share that I was one of you guys like a student uh, at those universities I have done the things you would have done as a as a student you have taken classes going to libraries doing fun stuff able to participate all different things that I was able to do uh, but one of the things I have changed and able to do is I was really involved. I wanted to be involved with everything uh, on campus, all the resources that university had to give. Uh, I was able to take advantage of those. As Catherine, you know, I visited her center, I visited MATLAB here. There are so much, so many amazing stuff that's happening in your campus today. So how do you guys, as a student, take advantage of those resources? How can that elevate to create something? How can that elevate and help you to build your business? Uh, as Catherine has mentioned, there's a pitch competition. How do you pitch to investors? How do you even communicate your business ideas to somebody so they really believe in you that, okay, I wanna put my money behind these guys or behind this team? So I have done everything you guys have done as well, or you have the opportunity to do that. So with that, uh, let's talk about my first company. Uh, so my first company, again, as a student, so I was studying, uh, my first company called Sarberpedia.com. So when I was a student, I was like, well, coming into the US, I had so many questions. I was like, I didn't know how, like, I didn't know all those answer of those questions. So I wanted to build a scholarly article or scholarly site where anybody can ask answers and have a scholarly articles about them. Because I didn't see anything, so it's more like a ask.com, what do you see? I wanted to build a more scholarly version of that. So I, as you said, I've been like pitching in those student clubs, like, hey, this is what I'm building. I want you guys to write for my you know, websites and contribute to that. And I was hustling back in the days, right? I was hustling, I was going to these clubs. I was you know, really involving some of the students to really come on board and helping me in this journey. So obviously this didn't go far. So it, it didn't go far, but 
the takeaway that I had is it's not about that I have failed. The takeaway is I have learned. And what I have learned and the opportunity that created is actually, so with this, actually I got to meet people at the John Papa John Entrepreneurship Center at E1I. So I went to University of Northern Iowa for my undergrad degree and uh, Catherine uh, was working at the John Papa John uh, at E1I. So even though my business didn't do well, actually my pitch got the innovation of the year in the state. So I was actually nominated for one of the student innovation of the year in the state. Uh, it wasn't, we didn't make money, but it did get some sense of getting people to know I was building something. Through this opportunity, back then, uh, Catherine's boss, Randy Pilkington in the middle, uh, who saw that I got nominated and you know that he wanted to reach out. He's like, hey, we have this opportunity at the university where you can actually have an office for your business. So as you guys can see that I had an actual office. So really that's a whole new version, right? You started from the dorm room to now have a real office at campus, which just create a credibility and confidence and really give you a space where you can focus and build your business. So as, as you guys can see, even though I didn't succeed as a business, but that's created opportunity. Now I really had a real space where I can build future opportunities for me. So with that, I think I'm gonna move into my actually next venture that I started. So again, all my venture really, as I said, started with problem solving. When I was a student, I have seen as a, you know, I was a student and uh, I worked for the orientation. So I was an orientation leader. I was helping everybody. It's like, hey, come to you and I, and helping them to kind of get used to this university and different resources. So one of the things I have seen that is the university they're giving out was this book. It's called Tradition Challenge, you and I Tradition Challenge. So as a university alumni, they wanted to have a program where students were keeping uh, all of the memories that they're doing. So they're going to I don't know, like let's say sports game, they can take a picture, paste it on the book, they're going to their uh, t campanilling, yeah, they can go telegating, so they can take all those memories throughout these four years and they can really record it on their book. And when you graduate, you get a medallion uh, that you lived like a panther when you graduate. So that was one of the programs they have done. But me as a problem solver, my bling on my head, there gotta be a better way Nobody is going to keep this book for four years at their dorm room. There has to be a better way to do this. So what I did as a student, I wrote a business plan. I wrote a contract. I don't know, Kathy, if you helped me back in the days, you didn't help that. Okay, so I wrote a business plan and a contract and I took it to them. I'm like, hey, I'm going to build a mobile app where you students will be able to take a picture wherever they go. They'll be able to record it you will have a data, live data, how many students are using the app every day, how much reporting they're doing, how many engaged they have. So they're able to do all this. They're like, wow, we didn't think about it. So without just writing a business plan and a contract, I was able to get this contract as a student. It was over tens of thousands of dollars I was able to make sales to the university uh, as a student. So right away, you know, with that money that the university gave me, I built the app. So actually I ended up building the app and you know, within our first year we had about 1500 students downloaded and using the app. Thousands of students have submitted this. The type of engagement they wanted, they, but they couldn't track with the physical book, they're able to do that. And you know, so this is kind of where the app and all the engagement come in. So again, at the end of the day, it's really that uniquely thinking about there gotta be a better way to do it. And there might be a problem here at that do you see campus today for you guys to solve? So, you know, as you're, I'm presenting, think of those problems that there might, there might be a better way to do that. So that was, you know, one of the business that uh, we did, then, you know, which, Captain, we got an offer from one of the company that wanted to buy us uh, at the point because they wanted to take that to other university across the US. So, you know, that just creates more and more opportunity and engagement and learning uh, as entrepreneur. Uh, with that, I'm gonna move into my next company that I worked on. Uh, so the next company that I worked on called Fan Food. Again, it's coming down to really understanding the problem. Uh, me and two other of uh, guys were starting this company. 
And when we're going to sports game, we're like, we don't want to miss a big play at the game. Nobody want to miss a touchdown. Like and when I'm going to, you know, grab a hot dog or something. So we wanted to build an app where you can just order through your phone and they get food would get delivered to your seat at the stadium. So you don't have to wait in the line at the concessions. So it's called the fan food app uh, that we started. Uh, and I was back then I was at the time was junior in college again growing this company and building the first prototype and doing that currently they're actually being used in cubs and some of the over 200 stadiums across the u.s use this app right now so this has been you know widely used uh this company i exited this company uh in 2015 uh and moving to my next company and again i'll be kind of talking about a bunch of companies as i'm spending time and i'll have some time to ask any questions so even, even as we're kind of building those you know, companies and uh, opportunities, I was involved in different opportunities that's happening on campus. So again, as you see, uh, OEI, Okoboji Entrepreneurial Center, uh, Venture Schools, that's one of the program we ran at the UNI, uh, Startup Weekend, that is you know, one of the Google funded program that runs all across the US. So just really being involved in those programs, as Catherine mentioned about all those opportunity, sometimes as a student, we don't really understand the value that what you're getting what do i get it's not but a lot of cases just the physical value as you see is all but also learning what do we have learned from this what and how this kind of learning could be engaging in the future in your life so you know i just want to point out there's a lot of programs happening on your campus and how all of you should be actually taking advantage of those resources with that, I wanted to kind of move to my next company um, called Cedar Valley Food Runner. Again, it's come down to the problem. The problem I had as a student, I was like, you know, the only food delivery food option I had in Cedar Falls was pizza or Chinese. I'm, I need to get my Italian food delivered to me, right? So again, the way of thinking is like, well, if nobody is doing it, I'll be the one who will do that. So I started a company called Cedar Valley Food Runner, where we build this, it's like a Uber Eats or like a Grubhub. Back in the day, we didn't have that in, in Midwest. So I started this company, Cedar Valley Food Runner, and it was a huge hit. Everybody loved it. And there's a lot of learning. So again, if you see that, this is a map. This is our first years of ordering, how many thousands of orders we have done. So we brought in about $1.4 million of economic development within our first year. Uh, in this just doing this app and again as you see that there are opportunities that's around you and we're able to utilize those opportunity and create opportunity for others so at one point I think we have over 50 drivers that we're able to create jobs for them uh, we worked with over 100 restaurants in the Cedar Falls and Waterloo area and able to really bring those economic development for them and one other thing it's very interesting like you know how things has happened as we're building the app, the whole city decided to tear down the road in the main street and the University Avenue where all the restaurants were. So none of the people could go in and get food. So the only way could get the food was our drivers. They are able to go to the back road and get all those figured out and able to deliver food. So we got so many people able to try how to get their product or order, you know, order food. And other learning stuff is we initially thought student would be our customer right it's like oh we're studying in campus but we found out that there's a lot of elderly in cedar valley that they had mobility issue that there are people who are ordering from california for their uncle's birthday delivered the really nice meal delivered to them or maybe aunt or relatives so you see that problem different way you know when you actually start a company as a business uh in again you have a pre-notion you have a perspective what you think is an ideal customer profile for you, but then you end up seeing it different when you actually run the company. So again, uh, we ran the company about three years. So we expanded the company to SynCloud, Minnesota, uh, and also Council Bluff, Iowa. So we had actually four cities that we operate in the company. And it was really getting out of control at this point. We're really two guys and trying to really build this company. We had so many drivers, so many restaurants to communicate. And we got few op offers for buy-in. Uh, so we got, you know, offer for multiple companies. 
and uh, we end up selling the company to Eat Street. I don't know if you guys have heard of Eat Street. They're like a Grubhub, one of the regional player uh, in the Midwest. Um, so they, uh, we sold our company to them in uh, May 2019. So that was a kind of you know one of the big kind of execution that we were able to see that wow, not only I was building these businesses for fun and able to solve problem, but there are real economic development we can make. There are real jobs we're able to create. Uh, there are problems, real problems we're able to solve uh, through this type of innovation uh, that we're building in. So with that, again, you know, that created a lot of opportunity. And, you know, as Captain mentioned, uh, you know, I was nominated for Immigrant Entrepreneurs, Entrepreneurs of the Year uh, in the US and a uh, lot of awards and a lot of achievements. But at the end of the day, I think the biggest achievement for me is you know, creating jobs and employments and opportunities for others. I think that was that so meaningful that so many people were able to have an you know, opportunity to us. And that same fundamental we actually took in when actually sold our company. So we had three opportunity we can sell the company to and we are able to interview them and see which of the opportunity will be the best fits for the drivers that we already had. And you know, that was kind of you know one of the interesting way to see building a company, scaling, then also going through acquisition as of 20 some years old, you know, trying to negotiate that. And you know, one of the recent achievements that I had, you know, we recently uh, featured on the Times Square uh, for my current business. We worked with the NASDAQ uh, Business Center and able to kind of, you know, see our business and able to thrive and do well. Uh, and um, I think it's just really exciting as a student entrepreneur and able to kind of create those opportunities and continue to build. Uh, and that's, that's kind of where, where I want to uh, share today. Uh, but with that, I wanted to kind of point out a few things. I wanted to point out what has led me to get here. So that few characteristics that really helped me to get here today and help my journey. And I think that's so important, right? You know, it's not about, obviously I have talked about my journey. And the reason I wanted to talk about my journey is I hope that I can share with you guys, I was one of you. I was one of you. There is no secret sauce, but maybe there's a secret sauce I'll share here. There's three secret sauce. I would say that was really helped me. But I just wanted to say to students that I was one of you guys. I was an international student. I didn't speak as good of English. You know, I went to Bala Medium School. I didn't know the culture coming to the US. I didn't know about any resources that was available until I met, you know, the JPAC and, you know, uh, the, the university. So I did have a lot of, I would say, lack of resources coming into this journey. But at the end of the day, you get to make the best out of what you have, what I had, and that's what I did. And again, I think one of the question, you know, Dr. Roach, your class is like, one of the students asked me a question, like, so we work with AI. I know you guys talk about all the business. How, does it, how do you use AI in the business perspective? How do you like in you know, a create business? So even though you guys, you, there might be students out thinking that we're only studying AI, how does it translate to business? Everything you do, everything we use, every single tools, platforms, resources, services you use, that's a, some sort of business. And able to t think as a business and able to dissect it, how that could be improved, how that could be in, uh, you know, seamless, how we, that, could be, that could be more alive, uh, value added in the process. That's how you create business. That's really the single uh, you know, secret of creating business. So I want to share about three, uh, three characteristics that actually helped me. So number one is grit. Grit is you are, you know, you're so, so the, one of the things actually I wanted to share here is uh, for the failure that you guys have, right? Like I think one of the reason we are so, uh, the reason we don't try to create our business is we, we're scared to fail. We're just thinking like, okay, what if we fail and what happens? So the reason I think grit is so important is it's like a passion and perseverance for a very long time. I could have talked about so many other businesses that I had and I have failed. And again, we'll go all day just talking more about it. But I think grit is a single characteristic that helped. 
because it's a you know passion and perseverance it's like whatever it takes you're gonna make it happen that's like as a founder it's like okay whatever like you know get some melon we make a lemonade right whatever it happens and that passion and perseverance the reason i build businesses is not just i want to make money like i'm passionate about it. i want to solve problems i want to make this world better i want to create services that people use so i think grit is so important uh in this any entrepreneur's life uh and i think failure is part of the process so that's that's something i really want to highlight is failure is part of the process if i didn't fail doing my solarpedia i wouldn't meet you know people at captions at the jpeg i wouldn't get there if i didn't get there i don't have other opportunities that i, I have created so i think that's kind of what the number one um uh, characteristic i would say number two i would say people you associated with that's so important and that's so important even in college right like the friend you choose the mentors that you have the professor that you are connected to you close and able to share those and you know that's so important the people you associated with i like to say that you are 90 90% 90% off who you hang out with and so for example as i am building businesses pretty much i also hang out with people who are founders like minded they want to solve problem go getter me make things better raise more money like do other things and we talk the same things probably my wife doesn't like it that i am only talk to those people right but that's kind of what my mind says that's what i enjoy that's what i like that's what i enjoy so this is kind of this is who i am built of the people i hang out the people i close with mentors like katherin uh and you know other mentors i talk about i don't think i'd be here today if people like katherin like you know other mentors lorries and you know the world that i had early on in my life who really give me tools who really give me supports resources and directed me we talk about katherin you know there are times katherin who had to jump on a call with me to a lot of interesting calls that i i don't think i was ready to take those calls and katherin was able to help me or you know other mentor they're able to help me how do you do that so the reason i think you want to have good mentors in your life because these are the people they already went through the path they already trail blazed for us they already have done that they already have the you know hard stuff in business or life or anything you know you whatever you wanted to do so having a great mentors around you is so important and so i think this is probably the second biggest characteristic i think that really helped me people i associated myself people i surrounded myself and one thing also i think i wanted to expand a little more more on this is this association of people has changed and it's continued to change it's going to change you know when i was a student there was a group of people i i hang out when i was a faculty or i was a staff i ha- hang out with different people and i i was a business now i have a founders i uh, i have a different sets of people now you know so this is a sets of people that continue to grow so it doesn't mean that you have to be stuck in where you were at but you always have a great people and you always would always thankful for the people who really paved the path and supported us in this journey uh, so i think this is the second second biggest uh, the third uh, i wanted to talk about is hard work i think who just given there is no there's no easy path as a founder and that's also another thing i think i wanted to share that that entrepreneurship is a journey and in this journey you have to be ready to do very hard work especially early on in your startup you're going to fail you're not going to make money this is not your job that you get hourly paid and able to do that but which is okay but that's really that hard work is able to you know i know that when i had a business office at the incubator at the university i was the one spending night and night and night every night midnights spending all those extra hours working on my business doing stuff because you know i didn't have money to really hire people to do that so you have to understand that i think there's no easy way to build business every single business you see every single product you build that's probably built with the back of a lot of founders hard work executive teams employees everybody involved in this business they have to really work hard to get there so i think that is really really important 
that you know I don't I don't I want to touch and this is that really basic three things that help me and that's why I'm actually here speaking to you guys uh, with that I wanted to actually talk to you guys that I can you guys campus you do have some founders you do have entrepreneurs I read about you know Miles Beacom I read about you know Matt Paulson so you know Dakota State University has created some of the amazing founders and you guys have seen that and the reason I want to showcase it and really kind of bring those back to see this for the student to see that you have example made right here on this campus you guys would be I mean they're gonna be more miles more Matt, you know coming from this campus and I think the reason I mean especially I think Matt's story and you know how quickly he's able to scale his business how young he is and able to even giving back to the campus and even you know uh, uh, for Matt and miles you know like the contribution they're able to do in the co community and the campus I think that's amazing you have really amazing people set a really amazing example for students here so even though you guys are really focused on tech, so much of high, you know, tech into cybersecurity, AI, and all this, but there has to be a business side of it. And I think there are people have found it. You guys have to be able to communicate and translate it to a business. So with that, again, I just wanted to thank you guys for giving me this opportunity to share my journey. Uh, and I'm also available. I have some questions, and again really i get to I, I really feel blessed to share my journey share my stories with students and faculties and other people uh so just to see that students like i was one of you that's pretty much the message that i was one of you there is no special sauce just really follow through these three things and uh i think you know obviously it has proven that i i have done well and i really hope i'll do well and well in the future and continue to come back and share other stories but yeah with that uh thank you all of you i'm ready to ask you know any questions that you guys have or Catherine, if you wanted to add to anything uh so thank you so much don't feel that you all have to raise your hand at once so russell tell us so russell tell us about the fact that you have a team here in Des Moines, and half of your team is in Bangladesh. Does that create challenges? Yes. Um, so a little bit of my company again. I really went through very fast with those companies. Some of the company I have built for my current company that I have. Uh, we have about twenty employees, uh, and out of twenty employees, uh, we have about half of our team uh, in the U.S. and half of the team in Bangladesh right now. Uh, and in terms of our uh, team uh, in the US team mostly looking to the work with the brands product development uh, our marketing teams and sales teams are in the US our manufacturing uh, technology teams in Bangladesh right now uh, so there are challenges because Bangladesh is almost but 12 hours uh, opposite time zone for us so right now they are at I think 6 10 a.m. in the morning so again, when I'm ready to end of the day, they're starting out the next day. So I actually had to do like, I have done a lot of late night stand-up meetings, really getting, making sure that, you know, they get things done really fast. And the next morning I come up, I have things that are ready to go for, for me to work on, or they have things that they need to. So it has created challenges, but also it gave me a perspective, global perspective, how do we build companies? How do you build a company globally? Now that is we're trying to, you know, we have, factories in Mexico we're really kind of focus on uh, Latin America like you know in this whole belt of um, Honduras Guatemala Colombia uh, we're gonna focus on that a lot of manufacturing happening that region a lot of manufacturing coming back to the US so we're going to focus on that as well like as our company and so uh, part of it I think it gives a perspective of how do you create that once you're able to build that now I can talk to investor maybe Japan actually I had investor call from Japan they're like hey would love to bring you tech to Japan. We have so many company. Again, I we're chatting with one of the largest brand in Japan and they're interested. So again, you see that when you build more global company, it also create global opportunities. It does have challenge with time. You just have to figure out how to build the culture, how to build the team, how to work together. And at the end of the day, get work done. That's it. So that's pretty much how we have done it. 
So two of the three things you said were grit and hard work. How do you know when to sell a business if you have a never give up attitude almost? Can you repeat the question? So your question was two things we talked about, the grit and uh, hard, work. hard work. And your question was, how do we know when to sell? Is that what? Yeah. So you've sold so many businesses throughout your career. How did you know when to, when it was the end of that journey of that business and when to start again? Absolutely. Great question. Uh, so for me, right now, whenever now I'm building, like right now as a founder, I get pitched from so many people. Hey, let's start another business. Hey, let's do other things. Let's do other opportunity. So, so many people actually pitch me to be contributing to them. At the end of the day, I look into the opportunity cost, right? You have a very limited time and you have to figure out what is the opportunity cost. Even for me to get involved with something else, I have to understand opportunity cost. So to coming back to your questions, when do you know that it's time to sell the business? And I think right now, the fundamental question is, you know, what is the growth opportunity? That's number one, like how big can, can this business grow? And do you have that, you know, mechanics, resources to scale that? How quickly can you do that, right? So for example, the food runner business, uh, if I give you that example, when we're ready to sell, we had, you know, over at the, with the four city that we have, we had, I think, close to 100 drivers that we were managing. And we had, you know, hundreds of restaurants we're managing. And we know that as we're scaling, it was really getting out of control. Like we either have to raise a lot of venture funds to hire a lot of people to manage all this and scale more, or this might be a way because we haven't taken any venture money is a good way to take some equity back, really take some money back to your pocket, right? Equity back, all the sweat you put into the business. So I think it's really coming down to this, when you feel like you're not able to add value to your business anymore to really grow your company, and there are other opportunity, other uh, you know teams or other companies, they might have a better leverage with what you're building. I think that's really the when you think, okay, this is the time to go. So that's, that's one part of the question. I would say also other question I, I, I can add to it is, you might be also building business at one time you give up on the business. Like I think that also comes down, I know a lot of students ask me the same questions, like, you know, I'm building this business, I'm so passionate about it, but it's not making money, right? At the end of the day, fundamentals of the business, the reason I do business is we make money. Like we have to make money, right? If I don't make money, I don't get to pay anybody, I don't have employees, I don't grow, nothing happened, none of the exciting, I mean, I can tell all the story, all the great stuff, all the good stuff I wanna do to this world, but if the business doesn't fundamental doesn't make money then it just doesn't work so i think for a company i think you should always when you start a company or business you should give yourself a time you should give yourself a timeline for your business what is the vision today let's say for the six month first of all for me if i want to start a business today first thing i have to look into it this has to be a big enough problem that means any business I build, there has to be so many people have to need this service or the products or the solution that I'm gonna build. If it is only a few hundred people, a few thousand that may not scale, that is my TAM, uh, you know, total addressable market, then it's not a good enough. I'm not going to do that. There might be other people who might be better on it. So you have to understand that, you know, first of all, for me, any business I do even in the future, it has to be bigger and bigger opportunity. Uh, so even for you guys, as you're starting business, you have to see the opportunity and you also have to give a very defined timeline. Give a three month, six month, whatever you're working, but then you have a fixed date. This is the day I wanna make money. This is the day I wanna get there. This is when I'm gonna launch. This is the way I'm market, doing market research. All those things need to be lined up and planned. And I think that's how I would do it. Absolutely. Yep. The pandemic has changed everybody's life. So tell me, with a client as big as Cabela's, how you made it through with container ships of goods sitting on the, port, the pier at the port and Cabela's wanting their goods. How did you make through that supply chain issue? Amazing question. Yeah, that is, you know, we really working and solving to the supply chain. Supply chain, 
contributes to 12 trillion dollar economy globally this whole supply chain that we're working on so if you think about everybody involved everybody's getting uh, impacted and again uh, what you have referring is we had at one point 57 container ship waiting to be docked in LA at one point and it would say it's gonna take us three months to really get all those like you know uh, cleared out so there's a lot of challenges at this time especially you know pandemic and you know during the Christmas time last year we had a lot of challenges but also as a founder as a problem solver there got to be a better way we have seen other way things has done again uh, it just cost more money let's put it that way so I'll give you an example one of my brand uh, they had they produce about 5,000 pants with us and they're like hey I need those pants for Christmas what are the things we can do and I don't want my stuff to get stuck in the in, in the um, in the port so I actually chatted with some of my friends in Emirates Airlines it's like hey I have these pallets what can we do it's like okay I'll put it in the plane and see if we can so we're able to work with the airlines and able to get some stuff within a five days where things were taking months for people to get stuck so there are alternatives again that is not eco-friendly as I said planes but the planes would come in regardless they would have coming in so it, it did cost a lot, lot of money but we're able to get stuff within a five days within a week I was able to get their product from the Bangladesh to New York to their warehouse and they're there so I think there's alternative paths of taking it there are other companies I think I have seen in startups right now they're innovating in this space uh, with people who are traveling more like a smaller pilots and smaller bags that you can do it but at the end of the day if something with the pandemic you know those people are not able to work on the port able to clear it out that's something we weren't, we weren't prepared for and I think even as a country I don't think we're prepared for it. so one of the things we're doing is I think we are bringing a lot of manufacturing back into the US some of them manufacturing back in the US uh, I think a lot of the manufacturing is are coming back a lot of the manufacturing coming back to Mexico you know you know Honduras Guatemala closer where we can drive in and don't have to you know use the whole sea as much so I think there are alternative things happening right now and so that's the one of the example again the challenges are there and that's kind of why we're working on it I think it's a big enough problem if you can solve it I'll be probably the richest person in this earth right so that's that's exactly what it is you know this is really a big enough problem exactly yeah yeah absolutely you know I think that's that's the other part of it right you know I think there were so there are a few challenges we had during pandemic so I'll give you one example is when the pandemic happened there were about 3.1 billion dollar worth of order cancellation just in Bangladesh big retailers they're just canceling this order they're like I don't know my store may not open I don't know if I can sell these products but that wasn't an answer because this factory we're living with this four employees and factories where they don't have money to pay for these goods they already paid for the supplies they have to pay for the employees we cannot just leave them hanging with this three billion dollar worth of production we said that we're going to take now we're not taking so you as you can see that supply chain and all those you know there are challenges from both sides and you know the reason I think we are really intersection and in building something in this not only I get to talk to the brand side what they're trying to do I also get to talk to the factory I'm telling factory that hey don't just work with one brand you got to put your eggs in 10 different baskets because a lot of cases this factory they only worked with one brand maybe that's just a target maybe that's just a, you know Walmart of the world they would just produce for and if they all cancel the order they didn't have money to pay for their employees so we as a company what we brought in is we're bringing hundreds of hundreds of brands and giving them option to diversify their supply chain and for the brand side they can go to manufacturing for the factory they can now work with many brands so that's also creates some kind of safety nets in the supply chain for both sides of the equal uh, in the in this process 
Any other question from you guys? Anyone else? Thank you so much for coming all this way, Russell. We appreciate you speaking, and we definitely wish you a very safe drive back for the six hours back to Des Moines tonight. So you and Liz, please drive carefully. Thank you so much.